colleagues. While you take your seats, uh, we would like to inform you that, uh, that the audience will be actively involved into the debate. There will be questions uh, uh, asked you by Mentimeter. You will see all the information projected on the screen very soon. There will be a, a conference number that you will need to use and uh, each panel discussion will include two questions to the audience and we would like uh, to ask you and encourage you to use this opportunity to share your views and the panel members will, uh, will uh, potentially answer to, to your, to your uh, points of view. Okay, so you see menti.com and the conference code is 2830. 85. There is a Wi-Fi in the room, no access is required, and we are going to start in a minute. Thank you for taking your seats. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 23rd edition of the European Corporate Governance Conference. The event is co-organized as part of the Romanian Presidency of the EU by the Independent Directors Association and Ernst and Young in cooperation with local partners such as ECODA, Bucharest Stock Exchange, Fondul Proprietatea, EBRD, Alpha Bank, Business Europe, ACCA, and other sponsors. There are more than uh, 200 uh, participants over the day from uh, more than 30 countries, and um, I'm happy to welcome you. My name is Sorana Baciu, and I'm the president of the Independent Directors Association, an organization whose mission is to promote excellence in business in Romania. I am delighted and honored to welcome you to Bucharest, and I thank you for joining the conference. The title of the conference is Corporate Governance as Enabler of Sustainable Growth, a theme of our times. Across the globe, the role of corporate governance is increasingly recognized in developing ethical, profitable, and sustainable business. First defined by the UK Cadbury Committee in 1992 as the system by which companies are directed and controlled, corporate governance has from the start attracted the attention of shareholders, politicians, journalists, and the public at large. Corporate governance frameworks have been developed in almost every country, comprising a regulatory mix of, um, a regulatory mix of um, legislations and securities laws, as well as listing rules and corporate governance codes. The focus on corporate governance intensified due to the corporate scandals at the beginning of the millennium, followed by the financial crisis in 2007-2008. These events revealed the poor corporate governance can negatively impact companies and their uh, stakeholders, having a ripple effect throughout the economy and the society as a whole. Therefore, the need for responsible and effective corporate governance has been widely acknowledged for ensuring both the success and creation of value for companies in the long term and the value creation for all stakeholders, including shareholders, employees, suppliers, and communities. How can this be achieved? Sensible as it may sound, in practice, it is not easy to harmonize the interests of so many parties. Moreover, there is no one-size-fits-all approach to corporate governance. There are many factors, such as national and corporate, uh, corporate culture and strategy that can affect a company's governance structure. In addition, despite regulatory advancements, it is still in the hands of the company to truly integrate the corporate governance principles, as the most corporate governance regulatory frameworks are based on soft laws. As such, the role of the board of directors become increasingly important in ensuring these corporate governance standards are met to achieve the long-term sustainable success of the organization. This role requires a shift in paradigm in both 
how boards are working from a traditional risk compliance focus to a proactive value creation strategic one. We trust the 23rd European Corporate Governance Conference will offer the very opportunity to share best practices in using soft law mechanisms such as principles, guidelines, and toolkits to steer good governance for sustainable growth. In the international arena, in the international corporate governance arena, South Africa has emerged as a trailblazer with its King Force Code providing a comprehensive guide to promoting corporate citizenship, shareholders inclusion, and forward thinking. We are very fortunate to have today distinguished Professor Mervyn King as keynote speaker at our conference, and I trust he will shortly share with us how we can get there. Throughout the day, you will have the opportunity to listen to an excellent lineup of speakers representing a diverse range of regulatory institutions, shareholders, directors, academia, with a wealth of experience in promoting good corporate governance. The European Corporate Governance Conference is a valuable opportunity for directors, investors, governance experts, and regulators to come together to exchange idea and leading practice. So please enjoy the conference today and make sure you make the best out of it. And now I have the honor and pleasure to uh, invite uh, Professor Mervyn King to address his keynote, his keynote speech. Uh, speech. Uh, it, is, um, it is a great honor to have Professor King here. It's not easy to, to have him um, uh, you know, in the country because he's such a sought after speaker. So um, who is Professor Marvin King then? He's a chairman emeritus of the International Integrated Reporting Council in the United Kingdom and the King Committee on Governance in South uh, Africa. Mervyn King is a senior counsel and former judge of the Supreme Court of South Africa. He's a professor extraordinaire at the, South, at the University of South Africa on corporate citizenship, honorary professor at the universities of Pretoria and Cape Town, and a visiting professor at Rhodes. He has an honorary doctorate of laws from the universities of um, Witterstand in South Africa and Leeds in the UK. He is a, a chairman of the King Committee on Corporate Governance in South Africa which produced King One, Second, Third, and Fourth, and the chairman of the Good Law Foundation. He is a chairman of the International Integrated Reporting Council in London, chairman emeritus of the Global Reporting Initiative in Amsterdam, and a member of the private sector advisory group to the World Bank on Corporate Governance. He recently received an ICGN Lifetime Achievement Award for promoting quality corporate governance globally and he has been a chairman, director, and chief executive of several companies listed on the London, Luxembourg, and Johannesburg stock exchanges. He has consulted, advised, and spoken on legal business advertising, sustainability, and corporate governance issues in over 60 countries, receiving awards from the World Federation of Stock Exchanges and International Federation of Accountants. He is the author of five books on governance, sustainability, and reporting, the latest being the auditor, Govadis. So, with all this, I let him to give uh, the latest news on King Report. Thank you very much. volume? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here. It's my first visit to Romania. You've heard I've spoken in over 60 countries. This is my 64th country. But I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much for asking me. It's my second time, Elizabeth, at the European Conference. Uh, I'm going to talk this morning about the healthy company might ask immediately what is the healthy company well it's a company where the collective mind of the board has been applied to ensure the long-term health of the company which is in the long-term better interest of all its stakeholders including its shareholders 
the era of corporate leaders during the 20th century was to focus on increasing shareholder wealth instead of the long-term health of the company. So I want to take you back a little while, not too far, <laughs> uh, to the middle of the 19th century. At that time, there were organizations that had unlimited liability. So wealthy families provided the working capital but when there was bankruptcy, they were also liable for the claims of all the creditors and all the employees. They started balking against this. The politicians of the day, sounds very familiar, wanted them to continue giving this working capital because they had promised the voters more jobs. And so eventually, uh, Lord Gladstone it was, who said, why don't we, as the representative of the people, the government of the day, create an artificial person and give it limited liability. There was opposition to it from theologians. The theologians said, who is mankind? And the ladies that are present in those days, it was mankind, it wasn't humankind. Who is mankind to create a person that has no heart, mind, soul, or conscience? What kind of a person is this? But as you all know, by 1844, the Joint Stock Company was passed in the United Kingdom and the company with limited liability was created. If you have limited liability, there are also limited rights. And the limited rights of a shareholder are, to this very day, the shareholder has no duty or responsibility to the company. And on bankruptcy, the shareholder stands at the back of the queue after the ranking of creditors, etc. But one of the consequences of uh, this was that at the time towards the end of the 19th century of the formation of the limited liability company, the law of being a guardian of an incapacitated human being was well developed. If you lived at that time, and heaven forbid, you had a 16-year-old brother that became incapacitated of mind, and you were appointed his guardian, you would have to do it being loyal to him. Whatever skills you have had, you would have had to apply to him voluntarily. You would have to diligently do your homework and plan for him short, medium, and long term, because the physician says physically he's fine, he's going to live well into his 90s. And you would take great care of his assets and great care in your decision-making for him. And those became the duties of a director of this incapacitated, inanimate, artificial person known as the company with limited liability. So they started marrying those two. And understanding that principle of incapacity gives you context and narrative to the duties of good faith, care, skill, and diligence of the director. So, I don't know where to point. Right. One of the consequences of wealthy families giving now equity capital was they became the directors of the company. And it was almost a natural consequence that other stakeholders, such as employees, saw them as the owners of the company. And to this very day, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, such, such a major shareholder, the owner of the company. Now, if I said to any lady present, I'm going to choose you, Elizabeth, that I own you, you'd be horrified. You're not allowed to own a person. It's in fact illegal. Slavery was abolished 180 years ago. And yet in public discourse to this very day, we talk about the shareholders being the owners of the company. It's a very strange kind of ownership. You've got in front of you a pen. It belongs to you. You can throw it away. You can give it to me. You can sell it. A director or a shareholder, a shareholder cannot remove a pen out of a company. It's a theft. It cannot use the company's assets. The, direct, the shareholder cannot dip his or her fingers into a till and remove money. The only way they can get money from a company, if the board declares a dividend, if there's enough liquidity, the company pays a dividend. 
The shareholder has a conglomeration of very important incorporeal rights. They appoint the directors. They can remove directors at extraordinary general meetings. If there's a dividend and if there's liquidity, they receive the dividend. But then their rights come to an end. So this cry for shareholders having, for example, a say on pay is actually nonsensical. When the average holding of shares of shareholders on the great stock exchanges of the world, I'm going to take London as an example, used to be nearly 30 years, 25 years ago. Today it's six to seven months. And with electronic settlement, ownership passing between 22 and 25 seconds shares. And when you want to see who the owner of shares is, you don't. You don't, you cannot see it. Because up on the screen at an AGM comes the custodian electronically. You don't know that it's John Smith who's the beneficial owner. So in 2016 at Harvard University, I had an interesting discussion with Professors Stout and Payne and Bob Eccles. And Professor Payne wrote a fantastic article in the Harvard Business Review in 2016, in which she said, the era of corporate leaders in the 20th century has been this focus on increasing the wealth of shareholders instead of focusing on the long-term health of the company. Now, the principle was a financial capital model and a shareholder-centric governance model. And the principle you will all remember was increase this wealth at the top and it would trickle down to the impoverished at the bottom. Well, the trickle became treacle. It stuck, didn't trickle down. And in fact, exploded in 2008 with the GFC. And so today, we have inclusive capitalism. So, until the end of the 20th century, we looked at value through a financial lens. What was the present value of discounted future cash flows? And then from a reporting point of view, we reported on the financials, balance sheet, profit and loss statements, some management commentary according to IFRS in this part of the world. Um, and when you think about it, it's historic. It's things that have happened. So not much that a stakeholder can glean from that as to the true state of play inside a company, nor the probability of long-term health. So if I'm the trustee of your pension fund, I owe you a duty to invest in a company that's going to be around and still creating value, let's say in 25 years' time when you retire. But I cannot make an informed assessment from the financials alone. In automotive teams, uh, terms, it was like building a motor car with the rear view mirrors but no windscreen. And yet that's how we reported for decades since the 1930s. And we believe, we as directors, believe we were discharging our duty of accountability. We were not. So, that is a most significant slide. You will see an extraordinary thing was happening towards the end of the 20th century, into the turn of the 21st century. This is um, research done by Ocean Tomo with McKinsey on the S&P 500, some of the world's iconic companies. You will see an extraordinary thing was happening. Trying to disappoint her. Anyway, you'll see that in 1975, so 25 years before the turn into the 21st century, you had tangible assets, almost 83% were additives in a balance sheet according to international financial reporting standards. 10 years later, it was 68%. By 95, it was only 32%. By the turn into the 21st century, it was 20%. The latest figures two weeks ago was 14%. So the intangible assets suddenly started becoming the greater part percentage-wise of the market capitalization of iconic companies. What was happening? Well, what had happened was 
with the third industrial revolution in the 1970s, the computer age, research was expedited and we were able to establish, not me personally, but the scientists, ecologically, that by 1997, public and private companies, and to a less extent individuals, had used and were continuing to use natural assets faster than nature was regenerating them. Clearly not a sustainable matter. And the famous statement by Paul Pullman, who was then the chief executive of Unilever, it's clear we cannot carry on business as usual. We've got to carry on business as unusual. We have to change. Well, what were these intangible assets? Those are they which you see on the screen. This ecological overshoot, and yet with population increase and increased demand for product. So we had to make more, but with decreasing natural assets. Then strategy. Strategy started changing. We used to strategize, we aboard with a collective mind, we used to strategize from input to output to the product. Suddenly people were asking the question, what is the outcomes? What are the impacts or effects that this company's product or service is having on the three critical dimensions for sustainable development, the economy, society, and the environment? Not my language, the language of your country. 193 countries signed the Sustainable Development Goals by 2015, and that's the language in the SDGs, that there are three critical dimensions for sustainable development in the 21st century, the economy, society, and the environment. And I paraphrase, but what they say in the SDGs, business is at the junction of those three critical dimensions. And as you know, most businesses are conducted through the medium of the company, which has to be governed. Reputation became critical with social media. Supply chains, we learned 12, 14 years ago with Nike, where it was discovered that child labor were making their shoes. The next day on the New York Stock Exchange, 40% of the market cap was gone. So great asset owners and asset managers started doing a due diligence on what was happening in supply chains. Completely changed due diligence, which was only a financial one. Then the Human Rights Charter of 1948, after the atrocities of the Second World War, became not only with willful intent, but started looking at, at it through a civil society lens. And like child labor, deforestation, company would lose value on a stock exchange. Civil society became a greater disruptor of companies than the shareholder activist. Just one example, Nestle, the world's biggest food producer. When it was said that the orangutan, a species, according to scientists, very close to Homo sapiens, that their original habitat were the, in the area of Malaysia, where they'd cut down all the wetland forests and grown palm oil, and the biggest buy of palm oil was Nestle. And Greenpeace had asked the Malaysian government, please cut down a few hundred hectares of these palm oil trees, regrow the wetland forest so we can reintroduce the orangutan into that area. Well, the Malaysian government did it. It is said that Greenpeace went to speak to the chief risk officer in Geneva at the head office. It is said that he never advised the board. Whatever happened, a few weeks later, Greenpeace produced a video, which was on YouTube, and a lady goes into a supermarket in Zurich, buys a Kit Kat, peels it open, and out came the cut-off bleeding finger of an orangutan. They ran to court, got an interdict to stop it, but of course, by that time, it was viral. This led to Nestle and the Malaysian government negotiating, and a few hundred hectares of palm oil trees were cut down. And any day now, the orangutan is going to be reintroduced into that area. Google it. Nestle, palm oil, orangutan. Huge disruptor of one of the world's biggest companies. And I can give you many more examples. So 
the great asset owners and asset managers of the world got together with some iconic companies and, as you all know, United Nations principles of responsible investment started. The great asset owners and asset managers of the world started thinking differently in making capital available. And the due diligence of a company that made a bond available for bidding in the capital markets of the world changed completely. It was not only a financial due diligence. And they started asking, well, this company has made $100 million EBITDA, but how did it make that $100 million? Was it made being substituted by society and the environment so that holistically it's actually been destroying value? That's not an investment for the 21st century. You're actually destroying value. And so responsible investment became the mantra of the day for not much, 43 trillion US dollars. So they started looking at what are the positive and negative impacts of how this company is making its money on these three critical dimensions which I've mentioned to you. So um, I was chairman of the United Nations on Governance and Oversight and also became chairman of the Global Reporting Initiative in Amsterdam. And in 2008, it was the year of the GFC, the International Federation of Accountants called a meeting of the United Nations. And it was historic. It was Chatham House rules, nothing goes out of this room. The World Bank was there, the world chairman of the Big Four. I was there as chairman of the GRI and the president, then president of IFA Core and Lidstrom and the chief executive of the end ball. And they said, we have to accept that financial reporting is critical, but it's no longer sufficient. As chairman of the GRI, I said, well, because we're in a resource constrained world and people have realized that it's become an important issue on valuation to see if the company is sustainable and sustainability issues like water to the beverage man manufacturer, has it been built into the business model and strategy of the business of the company? Or is it still seen in the silo as CSR? Well, it's absolutely critical, but without numbers is meaningless. At that meeting, I went further and I said, but you know, Companies are now reporting in two silos, financial and sustainability. And yet forever, these things have been integrated. Companies have never operated on a basis financial capital in Bucharest, human capital in London, in intellectual capital in New York. They don't operate like that. These things and the relationship between the company and stakeholders are integrated 24-7. We need to do something to integrate these things. This led to the formation of the International Integrated Reporting Council in which the great accounting organizations, the World Bank, and if you Google the IRC.org, you'll see 63 council members really representative of the great regulators and great investors in the world. So the whole idea was to change the mindset and the mindset had been to think of these things in silos. The revolutionary immensity of integrated reporting is not the report itself. It's in the thinking that you actually get that change of mindset, that you no longer look at corporate social responsibility in a silo. Like Coca-Cola, I'm going to show you. 12, 13 years ago, stop, didn't stop looking at the conservation of water as a social responsibility issue, but built it into the long-term business strategy of the company. And that's what we should do. Corporate social investment. Some countries have actually legislated 2% of profit before tax must be provided to CSI. Well, this is what happens. I'm the chairman. Some underling, go and build a school over there for so many dollars. Tick the box. We've complied with CSI without an application of mind of how it adds value to this incapacitated company on which so many people are dependent. 
So value today is no longer just looked at through a financial lens. It's looked at through a value creation lens. Has the company actually identified the critical sustainability issues pertinent to the business of the company? Is it entrenched, embedded into the strategy of the business of the company? So at the IRC, two years of working with 105 of the world's iconic companies and over 300 professionals, we drafted a 36-page document. And I'm sure there are many people in this room who have read the framework. Those who haven't, I'll talk to you as a judge, you will read it. Because it's in your interest to read it. This was a conglomeration of the input of companies like HSBC, Microsoft, etc. And then you can also Google the Black Sun Research House. They did an independent research of all those companies who changed their mindset as a board to think on an integrated basis and all the benefits that accrued to them. Well, what we said was you can actually put the inputs into a company, whatever its business, under those capital headings, financial, manufactured, human, intellectual, natural, social. And we said there is a... Where is the... Okay, back. That's it. We said there is a value creation process, and that's an infographic to demonstrate it. You've got your organization, so we use generic terms, company. And you've got your inputs into the company under those six capital headings. In the company, you've got your activities, how the company makes its money. You've got your outputs. But notice, in the value creation model, the output stops inside the company. It hasn't gone out yet. But your product or your service goes out into society, and it has outcomes. I think very well illustrated by the Coca-Cola company, that great company. 128 years focusing on the brand, the most valuable brand in the world. And four or five years ago, many of you in the room will remember that civil society in America alleged the reason for the obesity of our children is Coca-Cola. And the sales of Coca-Cola started plateauing. They met in Atlanta, Georgia, the board, and for the first time for 130 years, they started applying their minds to the outcomes of their product, the outcome of their product, and assumed that the allegation was true and changed their whole marketing. And you will see this is an extract from the London Times, the New York Times, and they started TV advertising. We will not market to children under 12. We will have nutritional labeling in all our cans and bottles. We will develop a Coca-Cola with no calories. Coca-Cola life. Does anybody have one? With a green label on it. And then we will make sure that children under 12 have exercise facilities at all our bottling plants around the world. Complete change of strategy. And you can see the impact of civil society as a disruptor. So... Here is uh, KPA Advisory Services, the president, in February 2019. The very act of choosing to tell its story using the medium of integrated thinking sends the message to an organization's stakeholders that it cares deeply about creating sustainable value for them. So we've moved from shared value to value creation. The criteria for success during the... Um, 20th century, a century of unsustainable development, was increased share price, increased profit, increased dividends. No matter that it was at a cost to society and the environment, and it was, as you know, the environment was hugely impacted on. So agenda items need to change at board meetings. One needs an agenda item inputs to outcomes. I ask all of you present as business persons, does your board really understand the outcomes of its product or its service? Have you ever discussed it? Do you really think it's not important? Well, the incredible thing was that the reporting became outcomes-based with the integrated reporting. 
strategy started developing as an outcomes-based decision. And then the Sustainable Development Goals of 2015, to which Romania was a party, was outcomes-based. Look at that. Clean cities, clean production, all outcomes-based. And I, my penultimate book, my name is Mervyn, it's not Stephen, I don't make money out of my books. I write them for education purposes, educative purposes. But they're new challenges, mindset change, capitals and stakeholder relationships, greater stakeholder expectations than ever before. I've just given you two examples. Responsible investment. The providers of capital, the great asset owners of the world, are adopting the principles of responsible investment. Financial capitalism since 2008 has moved to the inclusive capital market. How, how in employing capital is it having an impact on these three critical dimensions? And it's outcomes-based. So I started asking the question, if reporting is outcomes-based, if strategy is now outcomes-based, and if you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, where 193 countries and some of the world's iconic companies for the first time worked together with great civil society movements like Greenpeace, and came out with those 17 goals, if they all outcomes-based, shouldn't governance be outcomes-based? So I started asking the question, instead of this sort of grudge compliance of a mindless tick-box approach to governance, have a preponderance of executive directors, tick, have a nominations committee, tick, I asked the question, what are the outcomes of an organization from which, as an independent external stakeholder, from the outside looking in, you can say this company has been practicing quality governance and actually been adding value as to how it directs and how it manages. Because governance covers not only how you direct, how you steer the company, because direct comes from the Latin word for steer, but how you manage it as well. And the oversight of the board over how management manages and carries out the decisions of the board. But shouldn't it be outcomes-based once reporting strategy was all outcomes-based and the sustainable development goals, which your government has said, if we don't achieve it by 2030, we might not have a sustainable planet by the end of the 21st century. So, having asked that question, we the committee I chair, came up with four outcomes. If an organization achieves these four outcomes, it's been practicing good governance. The governance, the way you direct and the way you manage, is actually adding value to an organization. And very simple principles in that acronym I craft, I, intellectual honesty, that honest application of mind in the long-term better interest of the health of the company. C, competency and capacity. You can be the most acute and experienced director in the world, but if you haven't got capacity and you're sitting on too many boards, you shouldn't take that appointment as a matter of intellectual honesty. R is for acting responsibly and making sure that the company which you direct is being seen as a responsible corporate citizen. A is for accountability. To be accountable and discharge that duty, you have to account in an understandable manner. Not in a manner, and for the chartered accountants in the room, as you know, we've got two standards of financial reporting, BASB in America, IFRS in this part of the world. And with corporate failures and, corporate and financial events like the GFC, the standards have become more complex. They are incomprehensible to 999 people out of 1,000. So if you think you can discharge your duty of accountability by just doing a financial report, you're wrong. So what are these outcomes? So those are they. Ethical culture and effective leadership, value creation in a sustainable manner, adequate and effective controls and informed oversight by the board, not a blind oversight. So you actually get to report at each board meeting as to what are the relationships with your stakeholders? What are the sources of value creation the company is using? Does your company have trust and confidence in the community in which it operates 
and is it seen to have legitimacy of operations? If you achieve those things, you would have been practicing good governance. So I end by quoting that famous blind, that famous blind woman. The only thing worse than being blind is having sight and no vision. What is it you all see? You see a world which is not what it used to be. It's a world that's changed. We've got to change that corporate toolbox. You've got to change that mindset of thinking in silos. You've got to change it to an integrated one. So the vision must be to have a company-centric governance model which moves away from yesterday's primacy of the shareholder. It needs to be implemented mindfully to achieve the four outcomes of effective leadership, value creation in a sustainable manner, adequate controls, and legitimacy of operations. Do you have to grope in the dark? No. Go and read the IRC framework of December 13 and approach governance on a mindful outcomes-based model. And then you will be practicing quality governance. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Mervyn King, for sharing with the audience uh, the critical milestones to achieve sustainable growth, which is uh, the main theme of uh, today's conference of the 23rd European Corporate Governance Conference. And we are very pleased uh, to have uh, uh, Minister Georgia Ch Chamba, uh, Minister Delegate for European Affairs of Romania. I would like to ask you to come to the stage and share your keynote speech with the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for inviting me. I think it was a great pleasure to accept the invitation, and uh, it's a great opportunity that, uh, you, you know, you are holding the Independent Directors Association in the Erste and Young meeting, uh, the 23rd meeting of the European Corporate Governance Conference during the presidency of Romania of the European Union. I think, you know, this year the topic is of great importance, since one of the main challenges we, we are facing today is to achieve smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth in the EU. This is one of the main issues that is of great importance for the EU and the quality of governance, both uh, corporate and public, has a direct effect on the national economic performance and uh, ultimately impacts the global financial stability. We should not forget that when we speak about governance, corporate and public, we should we speak in the same time as well about regulation. and. The quality of regulation and, and as well we see what we, we call in Europe better regulation that means how we respond uh, uh, how we respond to the challenges that are stemming from, from too much regulation at the same time corporate governance remains one of the pivotal elements of sustainable business growth enabling companies to build a foundation of trust with their own management the investment community supervisory bodies regulatory agencies as well as the public. We should not forget that during the financial crisis, we have seen that both the reputational risk of governments and companies, especially in the financial area sector, have been so much, uh, so, so uh, have, have been so much tainted. And in a way, I think what have, whatever happened after, including the response to globalization, uh, has its roots in the bad name we uh, I think business had and uh, how it should try uh, to overcome this gap of confidence from the public. So in a way, I think companies started to uh, have to do more like political actors, and they have to regain the trust of the public. Uh, what we think is that uh, sustainable growth can lead to a higher degree of competitivity, inc an increase in market share, and not lastly have a positive impact on shareholder value, creating the premises for a win-win outcome in line with the people, planet, profit approach. We should not forget these are not something new. I think all the issues and Professor King was speaking about, about sustainable development goals, SDGs, I think these are something that are a great concern, are of, uh, of great challenge, not uh, for the governments, for the companies, and at the end cannot be tackled separate. I think it needs a, toge a, a, a together effort by governments and companies in order to be able to uh, to come 
to the moment where you know we can create value or we, we can create value but in the same time you know we are not going to destroy the environment we are operating in uh, neither corporate governance nor sustainable growth operate in a vacuum. They need to be assessed in the context of the emerging challenges in the wider business environment and have to be calibrated against the background of systemic change. The latter aspect is where governments and institutions should come into play, minimizing threats and maximizing opportunities for corporation uh, is something that European Union has been dedicated to since the dawn of the single market and I think it had to do even more in the aftermath of the crisis. Uh, I think in the light of the financial and economic earthquake that rocked the foundations of all capital markets and other macroeconomic perspectives, the EU has sought to equip the economy with better tools to not only manage shocks more effectively, but, also to, uh, but as well to foster renewed growth. We should not forget that the financial crisis in Europe was a sovereign debt crisis, so it was as well linked about a more critical relationship between governments and finance, the financial sector. Initiatives aimed at finalizing the banking union, and this is one of the reasons I think we had to, we had to do more on the aspects that we were not so keen on before the crisis. Uh, banking union, advancing the capital markets union, play a double role. We had to upgrade the regulatory frameworks and consolidate economic resilience on, on the one hand, and we have to create the premises for a more business-friendly, growth-oriented economic environment on the other. Uh, the achievements arrived at during the remaining presidency of uh, the achievements we, we, we had uh, during the, pres the remaining presidency of the EU Council concerning the risk minimization and resilience improvement are of paramount importance. With regard to the banking union, the final agreement reached between the remaining presidency and the parliament on a set of revised rules aimed at reducing risks in the EU banking sector is sine qua non for a more robust and more resilient banking system. Coupled with the recent Council General approach on non-performing loans, this pivotal agreement will help avoid the recurrence of negative spillover effects in the financial system in the event of a new crisis and thus minimize systemic risks in the European economy, or at least this is what we hope. Uh, related to the Capital Markets Union, the breakthrough brokered after years of tough negotiations by the Romanian Presidency on the revision of the European system of financial supervision will strengthen the regulatory architecture of the financial system, would enable European macroprudential supervisory authorities to better manage shocks and to contribute to efforts to combat money laundering and terrorist financing. I think, you know, we were a lot more ambitious during the crisis. Of course, because the crisis faded away, I think the level of ambitions ambition as well faded a little but still i think we have done things that we are not possible to imagine before the crisis in terms of regulating the financial markets the political agreements on the european market infrastructure supervision of central counterparties of the prudential requirements factor applicable to investment firms complete the picture the overall effect is that of a more stable and more resilient economy of a market equipped with tools to better manage fluctuation and enzyme risk all across the board. And in the same, it's about companies, financial risk, uh, financial companies that are more accountable uh, at the end of the day to the, to the European citizen. Proposals such as growth markets for SMEs, cross-border distribution of funds, covered bonds will contribute to more efficient financing of investment projects by unlocking additional sources of funding. This will have positive effects on economic growth at EU level, multiplying opportunities for companies and supporting business. Particularly relevant here is a set of proposals on sustainable finance very recently agreed on. These new EU-wide rules on integrating environment, social and governance factor in investment decision align perfectly with the latest evolution in corporate governance. Know-how, mirror increased interest in green growth and uh, inclusive business development strategies. Ensuring the stability of the EU economy at the end of the day, I think, is the mission of all the European institutions. Protecting it against potential so shocks uh, uh, in order to foster systemic resilience remains is, uh, as essential elements of a more robust economic union in all its dimensions. We should not forget that the discussion we have in Europe and the fact that we have some, we have a growth in the Euroscepticism and in a more national view of Europe and as well of uh, repatriation of competencies, everything stemmed from the crisis. One of the main reasons was that regulation was not up to the level that, uh, that the European citizens would like to have it, but on the same time it had 
it had a perverse effect that now everybody's asking for less regulation and they want to do it at the national level. Even the only way, uh, efficient way to protect the union is to have European regulation in place that, uh, that has uh, built-in safety features for the crisis. In the same time, the union is going through traumatic times. We should not forget that Brexit is a very traumatic event for the union in itself. And we should not forget that uh, uh, the world after Brexit in the union and in the rest, and in, in, the, in the United Kingdom should be uh, something that is a lot more focusing on, on um, corporate governance and public governance because at the end of the day, we should not forget that many of the things that were said in the run-up referendum campaign were some, uh, some me had a lot of the disinformation in it, and I just remember the issues that were related to the money, how much money would be left to Britain if it leaves, which at the end looks exactly the opposite, and I think this played a great role that there was no response, so to say, from, from the business community, proper response, or from the uh, or from the governmental side to say that all these are not true and these are uh, these are not don't fit in an economic reality because at the end of the day you know you are the ones that you as corporate uh, you should be the ones to say what can fly and what, what cannot fly and I think it was a weak response during the referendum campaign in Britain and I think this is something we are paying to so I think it's it's a need as well for for more ethical approach, uh, not only about, uh, pro, uh, not, not to be focusing only on the profit, but to, to focus sometimes a lot as well on the overall, so economic good, because at the end of the day, actually Brexit is a sort of business that is uh, lose-lose, so any, anybody's going to lose. Uh, as well, allow me to briefly refer to the impact of the digital revolution at both European and global level. The digital revolution has led to an integrated global economy, where economies are in constant search for investment opportunities around the world. The business environment needs reliable corporate governance arrangements that strengthen the confidence in a country's own corporation and stock markets and ensure efficient economic decision making. The global economic landscape is transforming at a faster pace than ever and then the entrepreneurs and innovators around the world are the driving force be behind this expansion. We are aware that the future of our industries depend on investments in new technology and this is one why one of Romania's main priority is to strengthen Europe's strategic digital capabilities and to improve the EU competitiveness worldwide. In the same time, we want to see the next budget of the Union that has a clear reference to, to a digital Europe, and we want, to see a Euro, uh, we want to see a budget that is, draws the line for more research and development and draws the line as well for more fundamental research that could have a great benefit for Europe catching up uh, with, uh, catching up on the transatlantic, uh, uh, on the transatlantic scene, in terms of technology, the future of Europe cannot be built without its sustainable economic foundation. Financing growth and development are those driving forces of a union that empowers and protects, of a union that can stand its ground globally and plays leadership role in the world. So let me once more at the end wish you all success, uh, having inspiring discussions and trying to. Have uh, as well would be to, to have your uh, your uh, contribution to a discussion that goes beyond you know the corporate or the public world. I think it's uh, a debate of today how how we should improve governance in order to to in the same time to better regulate, but in the same time to you know to not to impede economic growth and creating of jobs. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for sharing your keynote uh, speech and key messages uh, with the audience today. And now this is uh, the turn.